Morning, ladies and gentlemen. Barry Castlin here, Chagas Energy and Rural Development Specialist. And you're very welcome to this morning's webinar on the topic of micro generation support scheme. A lot of interest in this scheme, a lot of uh, queries coming in about it at, uh, for farmers right across the country at the moment. So we decided to uh, uh, do a webinar on this to get some of the information out there as regards what the scheme is about and what the opportunities are. So the micro generation scheme, or the MSS as it's abbreviated, is trying to get about 380 megawatts of renewable electricity into our electricity, uh, into our electricity grid by getting panels on about 70,000 billions across Ireland. And under the proposed schemes, um, the renewable energy systems between six kilowatts and 50 kilowatts, they're going to qualify for what's called a clean export premium or a CEP. This is the terminology you'll be hearing about um, over the course of this webinar over the next hour. So you get paid per kilowatt hour of renewable electricity generated. And that CEP will be available for 15 years. So there's an opportunity here for farm families uh, and they can play a very significant role in delivering a vibrant micro generation sector in every parish right across Ireland. So Ireland is going to need every kilowatt hour of renewable energy it can get rather than relying on imported fossil fuels. It's all part of our decarbonisation targets to reduce fossil fuels that are being used in the generation of our electricity. <clears throat> Excuse me, and at the moment, most of our electricity is generated, or 40% of our electricity is generated from gas. Um, so we, we need to be moving away from that and getting as much renewables into our electricity generation as possible. So with that, uh, I've invited Rory Summers. Rory is here on the line. Uh, Rory is the Assistant Principal Officer with the Department of the Environment, Climate and Communications uh, with the responsibility for the uh, microgeneration support scheme. And Rory's colleague, Leo Haverty, is also here on the line also. So good morning to you both. Good morning, Rory. And Leo, how are you? Good morning, Barry. Good morning, everybody. Very good well, morning, thank welcome. you. Um, lots of queries coming in on this, Rory, at the moment. Um, a lot of interest in it, so I know you're going to deliver a presentation on this for about 20 minutes. And at the end of your presentation, then we'll uh, take questions. So anybody that has questions, if you just put them into the box at the bottom of the screen, into the Q&A, we can put those questions to Rory. Some of you have already sent me questions, I noticed here in advance by email. So um, we get to those, try and get to as many of those as we can also, but you can also put them in here on the webinar also. Okay, well, Rory, with that, if you want to start sharing your screen, and I'll turn off my camera, and at the end of your presentation, we come back then for the questions. Is that okay? That's great. Thanks, Barry. Just bear with me a second. Okay, can you see the uh, presentation? Yeah, that's perfect, Rory. Yeah. Great. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Rory Summers, and as Barry has said, I work in the Retail Energy Policy and Regulation Division in the Department of the Environment, Communications, Climate and Communications. And I'm joined here by my colleague, Leo Heberty, who supports me uh, in our work that we do to deliver a microgeneration support scheme. So I'm going to um, talk to you today a little bit about the background of the scheme to give you an idea of the policy landscape and some of the drivers that uh, we were assessing in terms of uh, developing a design for microgeneration support scheme and, and ultimately in, in delivering what we think will help uh, con contribute to Ireland's renewable energy targets. I'll talk about the pol policy objectives of the scheme and then I'll go in detail uh, through the summary of what's in the scheme itself. Um, one of my main objectives today is to provide as much information to people uh, on the call um, because I know there's a lot of interest in the scheme um, and you know this, uh, this follows the, 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 the approval of the scheme which occurred last year followed a public consultation exercise and we know that we've got a large number of uh, responses to that scheme, uh, to that consultation, um, which just demonstrates the amount of interest in the scheme. Um, I'm going to, so that'll be the main body of, of, the, of the presentation will be the details on the scheme itself. And then I'm gonna talk about a little bit of the stuff that I think might be of particular interest to the farming sector. So I know that we've had queries on the return on investment, so I'll just give a little brief insight into our, our assessment of that. Um, talk about microgeneration support scheme in communities and how that works. And then finally, um, we've had, and we, we continue to get queries around the interaction between the microgeneration support scheme and TAMS, uh, TAMS in relation to solar PV, 
So I'll just give you uh, our perspectives on that and then close with the timelines on the on the scheme itself um, and then we can open the thing up to questions. So hopefully I'll get that done in the timeline. There's a lot of information to communication. So without further ado, just to give you the background, there's a number of different drivers that have been happening over recent years and we've been working on this scheme um, since, you know, right back to the white paper in 20, the energy white paper in 2010. But a lot more recently, um, the government decided to introduce a pilot domestic solar PV grant scheme. And that's been in operation since 2018. So that was the first direct um, standalone support for solar PV uh, in the country. Um, beyond a, 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 a short pilot that Electric Ireland have done uh, in, in providing an export tariff pilot. But this is the first grant scheme for, for solar PV. Uh, it's for domestic homeowners. Um, and to date, over 9,000 applications have been supported and 33 megawatts of solar capacity has been installed. We then have another um, piece of the jigsaw around microgem, which is about smart metering. Because um, when people uh, install solar PV um, and begin to generate, it's typical that they won't be able to consume all the electricity that they uh, generate. So some of it will be available for export. And in order to be prepared to be remunerated for any export going to the grid, measurement of those export volumes is required. And the Smart Meter Programme, which is um, overseen by crew and implemented by ESB networks, uh, began rolling out meter replacements in 2019. Uh, it's on a three-phase program. We're currently in phase two, which due, the overall program is due to completion in 2024. And almost 700,000 meters have been installed to date, with half a million meters being installed per annum under the program. This is an important enabler for renewable self-consumers. So those people who are generating electricity, consuming the majority of themselves, but exporting the residual electricity to the grid. We also have um, a large-scale renewable generation support scheme which is um, primarily targeted at our, our major decarbonisation targets in the electricity sector. So the renewable electricity support scheme is something that the first auction occurred in August 2020. And under that phase one or res one auction, currently 64 projects are uh, progressing through that. They um, accumulate up to over a gigawatt of installation capacity. And the first project of, of, of that auction actually connected in November last year with a number that was a, a wind uh, project. And there's a number of solar projects that are due to connect this month. Um, it is targeted at large scale renewable generation projects. So solar projects above a megawatt and wind projects above six megawatts. Um, so it's it what it's what it's providing is um, a large scale deployment to meet our targets. It's introducing solar into the renewable energy mix for the first time. Uh, and actually solar performed very well in that auction. So it has an important bearing on the solar industry in Ireland because it really begins to let that industry stand up. That will help um, create the, the infrastructure to deliver solar at all sectors in, in Ireland. And it also um, helps to drive down costs of solar in Ireland, um, which we've seen happen in other jurisdictions. Um, and that's that's what we've seen in, on the fourth point is that solar PV costs have been coming down year on year uh, since they were first developed. And in the last 10 years, they've come down by almost 70 percent. And that's one of the reasons why solar has performed so well in the most recent large scale auction is because those costs have reduced substantially and it's very competitive now compared to wind. Another feature uh, in the landscape is the clean energy package. This is the EU's legislation eight um, directives and regulations together making an energy package, which is delivering new entitlements and new obligations for energy consumers, um, including an obligation to provide a remuneration for exported electricity. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And finally, we have the government climate action plan and the program for government. So we had the first climate action plan in 2019, which set a target of 70% renewable electricity uh, in the system. And then we've had the more recent 2021 Climate Action Plan update, which has increased that target to 80% renewable electricity in the system. And it also includes commitments to microgeneration policy and a solar strategy. And it's part of the Climate Action Plan that the microgeneration support scheme was developed. If we look at the landscape, then go back over a number of years, we can see in the small scale of um, 
of installation size. So on the bottom of the graph here, we have installation size starting from zero to six kilowatts, which is your micro, smallest micro generation, moving up to six to 50, which is the residual micro generators. And then we have 51 to 400 kilowatts, which is you know, what we consider the, re the remainder of the renewable self consumers, the large scale renewable customers. We then move into the 400 to 1000 kilowatts, which is small scale generation. And then um, we're into large scale generation in the one megawatt, six megawatt, which, which is primarily being filled by the community sector at the moment. And then the, de the developers area in the six megawatts and above. And in yellow, we can see the impact of the solar PV domestic grant that I referred to earlier. So, oh, as I said, over the last three years, three to four years, we've in, implemented about 30 kilo, uh, megawatts of, uh, of installation capacity, which is what is on the left-hand side of the graph uh, on the vertical axis. And on the right-hand side, we've had in the past, we've had AER, we've had refit, and the last of the refit projects have been connecting in the last couple of years. But now we have res coming through and as I said, RES is targeting about a gigawatt of capacity. So we have a lot of development of renewable capacity coming in at large scale. We have a small amount associated with RES in the RES community pot, which is about 30 megawatts in RES 1. And then we have a large gap in the middle there in, in terms of the policy landscape. So no supports, particularly in the 50 to 1000 kilowatt space. Uh, limited in the 0 6 kilowatt space uh, and limited in the 1 megawatt to 6 megawatt uh, area. So that kind of shows you why the, the Climate Action Plan, the government, Programme for Government and the most recent update to Climate Action Plan include commitments around developing more uh, targets in the, in the uh, microgeneration space and also a commitment to a solar strategy which, which is intended to fill in the gap between microgeneration and the res uh, auctions. So what were the objectives of, of microgen, po microgen policy? So it is obviously to encourage deployment of microgeneration up to 50 kilowatts. Um, and what will that do? That will empower you know, citizens, uh, small businesses, uh, people in general to give them a, a direct stake in the transition to the zero carbon economy. It will assist the public take up of carbon reduction measures. So it begins to foster behavioral change in energy use by focusing in on how, how they use their energy and how to optimize uh, energy consumption from renewable sources. It begins people to think about energy conservation uh, and, and energy efficiency, which are key uh, uh, parts of the clean energy transition. And it will also ultimately, as people begin to invest and begin to change in their homes and businesses, how they use energy, it develops local supply chains and drives down energy costs. So a summary of what we've uh, developed as a result of all of that under the microgeneration support scheme. So the first thing is a clean export guarantee tariff for all exported electricity. And this is uh, an obligation under the clean energy package, more specifically, under um, Article 21.2D of the Renewable Energy Directive, which says that you, you, you will be provided with the remuneration for all exported electricity from renewable self-consumers. Um, and, and that has been delivered this year. I'll, I'll go into more detail on that. There's a capital grant provided for under the microgeneration support scheme. So new domestic installations and new non-domestic installations, less than or equal to six kilowatts, are eligible for a capital grant. The grant rates are being maintained from the existing pilot domestic solar PV scheme. So it's a maximum grant of 2,400 euros. The plan is to keep that at the same level in this year and next year, and reduce that by up to 300 euros per annum in 2024 and each year thereafter. Some changes to the grant um, requirements are that currently there is a minimum B or C requirement on domestic homeowners and homes that are, that are built before 2011 are eligible. So those two requirements have been changed and now there is no minimum B or requirement to be eligible for the grant and homes built before 2021 are eligible. So those are two significant changes to the, um, to the grant scheme and that makes the scheme more accessible to homeowners. Um, there's also going to be removal of the direct support for batteries. So while battery costs included as part of a new installation are eligible, the 600 euro grant for batteries will not be available under the new scheme. Secondly, then 
for those non-domestic installations above six kilowatts, there's a uh, feed-in premium for new non-domestic installations. Um, that clean export premium tariff will be 13 and a half cents per kilowatt hour or 0 0.135 euros per kilowatt hour. It's paid on export. So only export electricity to the grid will be remunerated. And the total volume of electricity that can be remunerated will be capped at 80% of the total generation. And that's to ensure that at least 20% of it has been self-consumed on site. The rate will be fixed for 15 years, and then uh, it will also be maintained at 13 and a half cents per kilowatt hour in 2023, at 2022 and 2023. Um, so if you, if you uh, apply and are successful in 2022 and 2023, you'll get that rate guaranteed for 15 years. If you apply in 2024, that rate will be reduced, reduced by one cent per kilowatt hour, again, guaranteed for 15 years. And each year thereafter, if, if you apply within those years, it'll be reducing by one cent per kilowatt hour per annum. That will be remunerated by um, the market value of that electricity export will be paid by the supplier and they will provide a top up up to the uh, 13 and a half cents. Uh, um, and that will be funded by the PSO levy. Um, if you have uh, electricity gen uh, exported above an 80% level, you will be entitled to the clean export guarantee for that residual electricity. Now, the microgeneration support, support scheme, it can be complicated when you hear all the information all at once. So we have provided a table of a summary of the support, which allows you to understand who's eligible, uh, in which category, for what element of support, are there caps on that support, um, and you know, am I eligible to a grant or a premium? That table there will, will be available for people to look afterwards. Just to give you an idea of the scale of the scheme that we envisaged, as I mentioned, the solar PV scheme um, was running since 2018 and each year it grew substantially. So we started with 71 in 2018. And by the end of last year, we had grown that to over 4,000 um, installations with a total installed capacity of 16 and a half megawatts and a, a total value support of 9.4 million. So over the, over the scheme to date, we've at this stage over 9,000 applications supported, over 33 megawatts installed. So based on that trajectory, we have looked at how will solar PV be delivered um, across all uh, um, drivers of solar PV. So on the left here, we have what's happening in the new build sector. So new homes and, and new properties. And we're tar we forecast rather that there will be about 45,000 new installations installed as part of new build. Now they're not being installed with supports by the government, but they are being installed in compliance with part L of the building regulations, which requires uh, a minimum amount of renewable generation in new buildings. We also see solar PV being deployed as part of the retrofit, large scale retrofit energy efficiency programs. So the B or B2 um, home schemes or the B uh, commercial and public sector. And we are seeing that a forecast of about 165,000 properties will be will deploy solar PV under those schemes. Specifically under microgen, in the dark green, we have the targets for the microgen support scheme. And we're forecasting a target of 60,000 premises for the small scale generators who will receive a grant and about 9,000 uh, installations for those in receipt of the clean export premium. So 69,000 properties overall. And what we can see in the years to 2030, to meet the 2030 targets, about a gigawatt of capacity can be deployed under these various drivers. And then to give you a sense of the total installed capacity, um, under the grant scheme, we mentioned 60,000 uh, installations. That would equate to about 180 megawatts of installation capacity. And for the 9,000 non-domestics receiving the clean export premium, there'd be about 200 megawatts. Um, and they're obviously larger, larger in size than than the, the first cohort. So as I said, um, the Clean Export Guarantee is the first phase of the enabling framework for micro and small scale generators. It is compliance, as I mentioned, with Article 21.2D of the Renewable Energy Directive. So all member states have to deliver this remuneration. Um, it's paid by suppliers at the market rate for all renewable electricity exported to the grid. And the CRU has been assigned responsibility to implement the Clean Export Guarantee. They published a decision paper on the 1st of December last year, and in it, 
their decision included that suppliers would set their own CEG tariff on a competitive market basis. Uh, so while the, um, while the tariff must be related to the value of the electricity in the market, which is tied to the wholesale electricity prices, the CRU felt that it would be good to introduce competition in this. Um, so it allows uh, suppliers to compete with each other to get the business of people who are exporting electricity to the grid. Um, they did set out the eligibility criteria for the clean export guarantee in particular you must have an export grid connection registered with ESB networks, uh, and you must have a smart meter where available as part of the smart meter program. Um, when will I get paid? So customers can expect an initial payment or credit from their supplier within a reasonable time frame after June 22, so later this year. And we expect the, um, the commencement of the um, effective date to be later this week. Um, the minister needs to sign some regulations which bring into effect Article 21.2D of the Renewable Energy Directive. And those regulations are with them at the moment for signing. This uh, clean export guarantee, it's not just about microgenerators. And in fact, the uh, Renewable Energy Directive doesn't use the term microgeneration at all. It talks about renewable self-consumers. So that's somebody who has renewable generation primarily for self-consumption, but exports some amount to the grid. Um, and so therefore there's no size limit on who can, um, who can receive the, the clean export guarantee. And just to say that on foot of a request from the Minister for the Environment, the Minister of Finance introduced a tax exemption in the finance bill last year, which allowed for a 200 euro per annum exemption from tax for, from the clean export guarantee for domestic customers in their, in their principal primary residence. So that means that you know there will be no tax impact for receiving payment uh, remuneration or income from the clean export guarantee. The exchequer grant. So whilst the clean export guarantee is a new uh, feature and it will increase people's benefits from having microgeneration, and therefore it reduces the viability gap over the installation investment versus the return. It is only a marginal uh, improvement on a, on a per annum basis. From our public consultation that I referred to earlier, we did get a very strong demand for grants uh, come through that, that process. Uh, and that is for a number of reasons, some of which is because obviously the financial burden of having to pay up front in relation to renewable installations. And um, so a grant reduces the amount of money that you need to have. Um, and it also, um, reduces the amount of finance that might be required if people aren't able to do it from, from savings. Um, we believe that maintaining the existing grant levels at the levels that they are under the existing domestic scheme will ensure that there's a smooth transition from one scheme to the other. So it creates less confusion or uncertainty around what the rates are and what is changing. And it also, when we changed rates in the past, we did see a big surge um, for people who are trying to grab the, the, the best rates available before they were reduced. And that creates difficulties in managing the scheme. So having it at a consistent level will mitigate that uh, risk. As I said, the potential is, or the intention is to reduce the grant by 300 euros per annum from 2024 onwards until the viability gap is filled, after which it is removed. So one of the features of, of these schemes and, and why we um, provide government supports, particularly exchequer funded supports when exchequer revenues are extremely limited uh, in terms of availability versus demand for exchequer supports generally is because there is a viability gap. But the corollary of that is as we inject that exchequer funding into the industry as part of people's overall investment, it reduces the costs of the installations. And I, I referred to the international experience, which is also driving down costs. So the, the forecast is, is that the costs will be reduced and by 2029, there'll be no requirement for any support. And that will be kept under review on an annual basis as part of the scheme assessment, ongoing assessment. Funding is assigned to this scheme. Um, as part of an overall envelope provided to the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland under the National Development Plan 21 to 2030. Um, so funding is assured for the next number of years. So the clean export, sorry, the, um, the exchequer grant is available for all, non, all domestic applicants 
and for non-domestic applicants up to six kilowatts in size. When you go up as a non-domestic applicant above six kilowatts, you are no longer eligible for a grant, you become eligible for the clean export premium. So this is an export tariff uh, and you would apply to your supplier for access to the tariff for installations from 6.1 kilowatts to 50 kilowatts. As I said earlier, it'll be 13 and a half cents this year and next year, a fix for 15 years, and thereafter it'll be reduced um, by one cent per kilowatt hour per annum until the viability gap is, is reduced. There's a cap of 80% on the export that can be remunerated, but any residual electricity exported above that 80% cap will be eligible for the clean export guarantee. It is uh, being remunerated by suppliers through the market value of the electricity and any top up that's required to meet the tariff will be funded by the public service obligation levy, the PSO levy. Um, and just to say that recipients of the clean export premium will receive the higher of the clean export premium and the wholesale electricity price should the wholesale electricity price go above the CEP. Now it isn't about a short term um, oscillation of wholesale electricity prices. And let's face it, given recent experience, we've seen a lot of you know, rises and, and, and spikes in the electricity price. But what we're really looking at here, because we're dealing with consumers here rather than professional generators, we're talking about the average wholesale electricity prices over the preceding six to 12 months. So we see a much more smooth trajectory of pricing when we look at it over those horizons. We do see that electricity prices are very high, uh, abnormally high at the moment, but there are some very significant short-term factors around that. And the long-term trend will be for wholesale electricity prices to reduce over the period. As I said, around uh, return on investment, we assessed over 80 or almost 80 different archetypes across multiple sectors, including agriculture. So we looked at um, four different technologies. We looked at micro wind, micro hydro, micro renewable CHP and solar PV. Uh, ground and, and roof mounted. Um, roof mounted solar PV is the lowest cost technology with ground mounted just slightly behind. Um, as I said, retail electricity costs uh, are higher than the CEP or the CEG. Um, so this is the rates that you pay in your bill. So if you're a domestic, I think at the moment you might be looking at a, a sort of a standard domestic electricity tariff of around 23 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, and for micro generators, you know, anyone up to 50 kilowatts is probably not getting it much better than that. So 22 maybe um, cents per kilowatt hour. The CEP is 13 and a half cents guaranteed for 15 years. And the, sorry, the CEP rather is 13 and a half cents guaranteed for 15 years. And the CEG will be provided by suppliers on a competitive basis. We expect it will be below that rate. So if you're um, generating electricity and you're looking at the best use of that electricity, the optimum return on investment for that generation is to maximize self-consumption because you are offsetting those retail rates. Those retail rates at 23 cents are of much greater value to you to avoid than to try to receive a remuneration for exporting electricity to the grid and getting whether it's the CEP or the CEG, it won't matter. Neither of them are going to be as valuable to you. So in terms of a return on investment, the best return on investment will be about getting the, the lowest cost of installation. This is a really important factor when people are looking at um, the prospect of investing in solar PV. It's really important to get a really competitive price. And um, because solar PV is, um, you know, it's a marginal investment in the sense that small changes in inputs have a big impact on the outputs that you get in terms of return on investment. So if you don't have a good value installation, it's going to be, take you longer to pay back. If you're not maximizing your self-consumption, it's going to take you longer to pay back. If you do get a good cost and you, you do maximize your self-consumption, you will achieve an eight to nine year payback. Okay, um, But it is important to understand that the return on investment can be very site specific. And what I mean by that is, Two sites could have the same size of installation. They could have, let's say, if you maximized it to 50 kilowatts. However, where they install them in terms of the roof space, for example, that they put them on, um, they could have very different costs based on the condition of that roof. So, you know, that's one factor that will change the return on investment for those two sites, even though they're installing the same uh, 
quantity of solar panels. The other thing is, what's the orientation of this roof space? So if all of that is south facing, then it's going to do better than if you have to split that, those solar panels over two different um, facing roof aspects, because they will generate different quantities of electricity and they would generate slightly differently at different times of the year. Um, and then it's about, you know, you could have the same amount of solar panels on two different sites, but you could be consuming very different quantities of electricity. So depending on the demand that you have, if you've matched your demand for electricity to the size of your installation, you will have a higher self-consumption and that will give you a shorter payback period. And the other thing to say is, given that we're talking about an eight to nine year payback period, it's important to remember that solar PV equipment has a 25 to 30 year lifetime. And many of it will come with uh, a 2025 and up to 30 year guarantee from the installers. And um, so you're going to get a long time to, to, gain, to gain from this investment, a lot of return years after eight or nine years of payback. In relation to communities in the microgeneration support scheme, renewable energy communities are eligible to take part. And for that, we mean individual farms and farm co-ops as part of a renewable energy community. We assume or we envisage that OECs have at least one premises, which is an existing electricity consumer. So OECs could be community um, renewable uh, activists. So they could be co coordinating together to install on a local community hall or a sports facility. Uh, they pool the investment and then they try to share the electricity that they generate, both using it on site at the facility where it's installed and also sharing it amongst their members, but also potentially exporting some and receiving remuneration. Um, there are eligibility requirements to be met when setting up renewable energy community. I'll come on to that in the next slide. And it's important to say that supports for renewable energy communities are the same as for other renewable self-consumers. So they're not getting any less because they're organizing as, as, as a group entity. Um, it's also envisaged that residual electricity for export can be used by the OEC itself and its members via energy sharing, energy ag aggregation, and peer-to-peer -peer trading or other appropriate trading arrangements, which are outside the scope of the microgeneration support scheme. And the CRU or the Commission for the Regulation of Utilities, who's the electricity regulator, has publicly consulted on arrangements for communities, including OECs, and more details are available on their website. In relation to the renewable energy community definition, this comes from the Renewable Energy Directive. And it, it's important to say that, um, you know, I leave the details of this to, to be read by participants of the webinar at a later date, but I've just highlighted some areas which I think are important to, to bear in mind. So apart from the, the other aspects of it, it is important that um, shareholders or members participation does not constitute their primary commercial or professional activity. So an, a renewable energy community cannot be a professional electricity generator. It can only be done as part of uh, supporting their primary commercial or professional activity. And the other really important factor is that the primary purpose of the renewable energy community is to provide environmental, economic, societal or social community benefits for shareholders or members or the local areas where it operates rather than financial profits. So whilst a renewable energy community can invest in solar PV and it can pay back that investment and have small profits, the majority of those profits have to be reinvested in those um, local community social environmental projects that benefit its shareholders and its members. I anticipate that there's some questions around how the microgeneration support scheme will work in relation to the TAMS and, and how TAMS is supporting solar PV. So as we understand the TAMS supports solar PV up to a maximum of 11 kilowatts, which was a recent increase, uh, but it does allow minimal or in, in fact the rules for TAMS as we understand it, do not allow export of electricity under the terms and conditions published by DAFM. Um, and notwithstanding administrative differences and the available capital envelopes, on a comparative basis the grant support for TAMS is more attractive than the microgeneration support scheme grant and that's just a fact. So a 40% grant 
uh, or for young farmers, a 60% grant on installation cost is very attractive. Um, and the micro generation support scheme is not targeting the agricultural sector specifically, and it's not trying to compete with TAMS either. So if people have available envelope to, um, to use under the capital envelopes under the TAM scheme and they want to invest in solar PV, we believe that TAMS is a very good option for them. Now, having said that, it is possible for farmers to avail of the Clean Export Premium for additional installation capacity above the 11 kilowatts, but there are administrative challenges that need to be worked out. And that will happen as part of the publication of the terms and conditions for the microgeneration support scheme. It is important to say that it is not possible for farmers or for anybody else for that matter to receive a grant, be it a TAMS grant or other grant, and microgeneration support for the same investment. So there's no double supports available, and that wouldn't be unusual to the microgeneration support scheme. That would be a general principle. I mentioned small scale generation as part of the Program for Government and the Climate Action Plan. So Climate Action Plan 21 includes commitment to develop a small scale generation scheme for generators above 50 kilowatts to support rooftop and ground mounted solar PV in areas that are not being supported by the microgeneration support scheme or the renewable electricity support scheme. So we are working currently with the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland on the policy design for a small scale generation support scheme, which is being progressed this year and will, there will be a public consultation later in the year. We expect the scheme to become operational in 2023 and it will enable larger businesses, farms and community projects to maximise their participation in the energy transition. So just to say that um, the, there are other policy enablers that are relevant. Um, more, very recently, ESB Networks published the mini generation connection process on the 17th of December, 2021. This is for export grid connections between six and 17 kilowatts single phase and 11 and 50 kilowatts three phase. And more information is available on their web website. This is a new export grid connection process. Um, Smart meters, as I said, are available to almost 700,000 customers and half a million smart meters have been installed per annum under the program. So smart meters enable you to measure the export of electricity and to be remunerated for those measured volumes. And finally, the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage are working revisions to the solar exemptions and the planning regulations. A strategic environmental assessment and an appropriate assessment are underway with revisions now expect, expected later this year. So what we expect out of that is that there will be um, increased exemptions from planning provided to those buildings that have already provided with exemptions under the existing regulations. And also exemptions will be extended to new building types, including educational, community and sports facilities. So just to sort of wrap up here, we see that the policy landscape based on support schemes that the government is, is bringing through has much more uh, uh, capacity targeted. So microgeneration support scheme is targeting 380 megawatts. The small scale generation may target up to half a gigawatt. Um, community res will be increased through successive res auctions um, to increase from 30 megawatts to over 100 megawatts. And the renewable electricity support scheme and the offshore renewable electricity support scheme is targeting you know, over the period to 2030, in the region of eight gigawatts. Um, so a huge amount of, of work to happen there. The timelines for the market generation support scheme. So we had the government decision on approving the scheme in December last year. The clean export guarantee effective date should be this week based on the minister signing regulations into law. The final scheme design will be published in this quarter. The transition of the domestic grant scheme to the micro generation grant scheme is targeted to happen this week. And then after that, the SEI is um, going to assess extending grants to, so that's, that microgeneration grant scheme will be for solar PV initially, and their SEA will then look to extend that to other technologies on a phase basis um, around beginning around June this year. And then after that, they will extend the grants to non-domestics in the summer of this year. And we're working with SAI to provide more information on the exact dates for that. And then finally, the CRU is to determine an implementation plan for the clean export premium by quarter three this year. And again, we're working with them on that plan. Right, so that's a quick, very quick run through and a lot of information. So I appreciate um, 
there's probably a number of questions and I look forward to, uh, to answering those, but thank you for your attention. Thanks very much for that, uh, Rory. That's great, great overview there of the, of the scheme. Probably complicated maybe for some people who's hearing it for the first time. If you can stop sharing your screen there, Rory, for the moment and back at the gallery view now. Okay, and Leo is back there as well. So lots of queries coming in there on this, lots of questions. So you can keep them coming into us. If we don't get back to them all today, we will get back to you eventually. If we, if you put on your identification and we have your email address, we will be able to get back to you on them as well. So um, just probably in the area of, um, I suppose, maybe some of the terminology, I'll just explain that the RESS, some people asked what that was, that's the Renewable Electricity Support Scheme. So that's covering the larger installations, which would be the solar farms, maybe, you know, into, into the from 500 kilowatts upwards. They're the larger projects. Maybe you have, micro, you, have, you have community projects involved in that as well in the RES scheme also. So people do get confused between these different uh, schemes. The micro generation is up to 50 kilowatts. So anything up to 50 kilowatts is comes in under micro generation. So, but people are also getting confused that space between the 50 kilowatts and the 500 kilowatts. So maybe just reiterate on that, Rory, uh, if you if you wouldn't mind, what what's coming down the track for that for that space? Yeah. So the small scale generation scheme is work that's underway at the moment. Um, to develop a scheme to support people from 50 kilowatts up to 1,000 kilowatts. So from <clears> between microgeneration support scheme and the renewable electricity support scheme. Um, when we look at people in that scale, we have a mix of um, larger renewable self-consumers. So people who have um, homes and businesses, uh, well, businesses rather than at that scale, they'd be all businesses. Um, they have electricity demands on those sites and they have the opportunity to install um, solar PV, for example, in order to reduce their electrical demand and also to export to the grid. But we would also see at the larger end, maybe between half a megawatt and one megawatt, we'd see the opportunity for small scale developers and small scale community projects, which would be effectively greenfields, um, renewable farms, solar farms in particular, and um, that would be similar to those that are currently operating in, in the large scale renewable electricity support scheme. So um, the plans around that are being developed currently um, and a public consultation will happen later in the year or in first quarter of next year with the scheme targeted to, to get underway in 2023. Okay, Rory, a lot of questions. We try and get through them here as quickly as we can. Uh, would TAMS cover electricity from the farmhouse or just the outhouses. Maybe I'll answer that particular one. TAMS does not cover the domestic dwelling house. It only covers the farm. So an allowance is made for the, a deemed allowance is made for the amount of electricity that would be used in the domestic household. Because very often the same MPRN is used, or the same meter is used for the farm as well as the outbuildings. So a deduction does need to be made from TAMS and that could be in the region of around five kilowatts uh, that would be used for the domestic house. Maybe Rory, you cover that one in relation to this, where you do have uh, for the CEP, uh, the clean export premium that, that would be payable here. If, if somebody did opt to go for the clean export premium and they have the farmhouse and they have their the farm on the same meter, how will that be handled from a clean export premium perspective? Yeah, I mean, as I said, there are some um, details to be worked out in relation to the clean export premium. Primarily, we look at it in terms of it is a non-domestic electricity customer. So if they have a non-domestic tariff, um, the register is non-domestic with their electricity supplier, then we wouldn't be, uh, we don't propose as things stand today to look at the difference between um, how that use, how that electricity is used behind the meter. So the domestic house, if it's if it's on the same supply as as a non as ultimately as a, a non-domestic meter supply. Well, then that's fine if they, if they can use up that electricity through a CEP support installation, then so be it. You mentioned there earlier on that you can't get a TAMS grant, for example, and also get a clean export premium payment. But could somebody, for example, forfeit the clean export premium payment and say, I'll just go for the TAMS grant of 40%, and then on top of that, that they could get the clean export guarantee, which is paid by the electricity supplier? Yeah, so it's important to say that you cannot get the um, clean export premium 
and the TAMS grant for the same installation. Okay, so people need to, to assess themselves what is the most advantage support available to them for the particular arrangements. As we understand it, the rules of TAMS don't allow for export of electricity. So all the electricity must be consumed on the site. And um, now in practice, I'm not sure if that's either feasible or practicable. Um, but one thing to bear in mind is you will not get paid the clean export guarantee unless you've registered with the ESB networks for an export grid connection. Um, now, currently, an export grid connection up to six kilowatts single phase and three kilowatts, or 11 kilowatts three phase is called a microgeneration, an NC06 connection. Uh, that's a inform and fit process. So it's very straightforward to get that grid connection. You, um, you make an application to uh, ESB networks. And if after 20 days, you haven't heard from them, you're able to commence the uh, installation with your uh, registered electrical contractor. And there are no costs associated with that uh, in, in, in terms of if you haven't heard anything from ESB networks. Now there is that they do reserve the right to uh, contact you about your application and there may be some costs, but we understand little or no costs have ever been um, imposed to date. Separately then, as I mentioned, there's a new grid connection process for six kilowatts to 17 kilowatts single phase and from 11 kilowatts to 50 kilowatts three phase. Now there is a charge for that. I understand that it's about 760 or 70 euros plus VAT. And so not an inconsiderable cost for the application. It, it has been done under a pilot basis. So they're allowing for 150 applications per annum or uh, to run the pilot for six months, whichever happens soonest. And they expect that the application process will be responded to in approximately eight to 10 weeks. Um, any upgrades that are required as a result of that application will be paid by the applicant <clears throat> at 100% of the costs. So there are terms and conditions available on the ESB Networks site and they, they term that grid connection an NC07 or a mini generation connection. I know that introduces another term which doesn't help with the confusion, but that's ESB Networks terminology. Okay, but that's, that's, so, a very, that's a very interesting development of, a, of the increase there from six kilowatts to 17 kilowatts for single phase and the increase for three phase from 11 kilowatts to 50 kilowatts. So that, that really was necessary in order to make yeah. all of this happen. Yeah, um, it's, a big, it's a big enabler. And just to answer the question, ultimately, um, the, the TAMS conditions have to be observed by a TAMS applicant. Um, we understand that that means that they are diverting electricity over potentially to hot water use. Um, and also there are a number of batteries and batteries are allowable under the scheme. So people will be diverting any residual generation over to batteries, in which case in those scenarios, if, they, if they're doing one or both of those things, there is no export available to go to the grid. And they may comply with the TAM scheme with those arrangements um, and that's fine. I, don't, I, I can't answer today whether somebody can subsequently apply for an export grid connection from ESB networks and change their arrangements behind the meter to, to do less diversion away to hot water um, and then allow some of that to go to the grid and be paid a remuneration. I think that would be, have to be answered by the TAMS team. Okay. Can somebody, uh, another question that came in here, can somebody apply for the scheme up to six kilowatts on their own domestic dwelling house and, then, in, and install more than six kilowatts, for example, for a three phase supply that they have on their farm? So if they're two separate supplies, yeah. they would only be, they would be treated individually um, from a microgeneration support scheme perspective. So um, a domestic customer is eligible. To, uh, um, in fact, as a domestic customer, the installation size for that domestic dwelling is not limited. Okay, so they can install 10 kilowatts if they want, um, but they will only be remunerated up to a maximum of 2,400 euros which is on the basis of an installation up to four kilowatts in size. Um, and if they have a separate connection on site, then they would be eligible if it's a non-domestic connection to the arrangements for non-domestic applicants. And again, depending on the size of the installation, they could also be in, in, entitled to up to um, six kilowatts installation to a grant uh, and above six kilowatts to a clean export premium, but it's one or the other okay. um, for the non-domestic. A uh, question has come in here, I suppose a lot of it is to do with maybe self-consumption and we won't go through that 
today because that's I mean, that's a, for a different webinar. But maybe there's a question here about planning uh, requirements and planning permission requirements uh, associated with this because. I know that on a farm situation, you can go up to 50 square meters without requiring planning, and that's probably in the region of between 9 and 10 kilowatts uh, okay. of solar PV that could be without planning. And also in a domestic situation, as far as I understand it, it's still around 12 square meters uh, on a domestic dwelling house. So that's, that is limiting. You wouldn't, you wouldn't get your 6 kilowatts at that or your 5.9 kilowatts at that limit. So is there any uh, uh, word of change in the planning laws around this? Yeah, so unfortunately, um, the, the revisions to the exemptions for solar installations haven't happened as fast as, as we would like. Um, they were originally planned to be uh, implemented in December or quarter for 2020. Um, we're now in 2022, and the most recent information that we have available is that that is going to happen later this year. Um, but what I can tell you is that there will be improvements in those um, minimum areas that are allowable as exempted development. Um, and in fact, the approach has changed slightly. So um, whether your, um, your 12 square meters, which is currently allowed, is on the aspect of your roof, which is facing the road for a domestic house, for example, or it's on the aspect of a roof, which is you know at the back of the house, doesn't matter under the current exemptions. But the proposal under the revised exemptions would be to only limit the square meter area of the um, exempted solar installation on the aspect of the house that's facing a public road. And that means that if you if you want to put a higher uh, area on the back of the house, um, there may, there will be little or no exempt, uh, limits to the exemptions there. We're also um, looking at uh, extending it to um, different roof types so we've got pitched roofs and flat roofs on uh, commercial buildings and flat roofs the exemptions will be very generous in terms of because there's very minimal impact for those flat roofs on anybody who is in the, the you know in the vicinity of that building and these exemptions are all about the impact on the visual amenity so what does it mean for me if I'm living across the road from somebody who's installing solar panels? Are they are they negatively impacting on my visual amenity? And if not, then there should be much greater exemptions. Yeah. Um, so you will also get greater um, minimum exempted areas on agricultural buildings and other industrial uh, and, and commercial buildings. Okay. Thanks for that, Rory. Yeah, there's a question here about the general rule of thumb of the cost per kilowatt hour of installed capacity. So, you know, if you went for five kilowatt or a six kilowatt PV array in your domestic dwelling house or in farm situation, what is the average cost? So it is in, in the region of around 1,000 euro per kilowatt installed for the panels itself. There is costs, the, the, the cost will vary. That's just a rough rule of thumb. The cost will, it's economies of scale. So the higher you go, so larger installations, Will have a lower cost but there are installation costs on top of all of that there are costs for inverters and um, voltage optimizers that does need to be taken into account there as well so just to be aware of all of that um, the question here when will the pso levy go away well that might go away for a while that's really funding all of this rory isn't it well it's an interesting question because at the moment with electricity prices so high under the renewable electricity support scheme the, the one project that's currently connected is actually paying into the pso levy because it is a two-way contract for difference. So they would have had a strike price and the average strike price for, that, for those projects was 74 euros per, kil, per megawatt hour. And, but they're in, they, so they, if, if um, wholesale electricity prices are below that, then the PSO supports the difference. Um, and let's say a year, two years ago, the wholesale electricity price would have been around 40 euros per megawatt hour. So PSO would have been paying 34 euros per megawatt hour for every megawatt hour that project e exported. But at the moment, wholesale electricity prices are you know, much higher than that, probably um, 10 to 15, uh, 150 euros per megawatt hour. So that project is actually paying in the difference from the rate that it's receiving and its strike price in the auction. And that means that it's having a, a depressing effect on the PSO itself. And as more and more projects connect, there is a possibility that the PSO could become a pot of money. Now, look, you'd want a crystal ball to know whether any of this eventuality would ever happen. 
but it's just to say that the approach around PSO support has changed over the years. And in line with other jurisdictions, a two-way contract for a difference under the res auction and the future O-res auctions will um, take account of wholesale electricity price and the benefits that can accrue to the PSO. So in relation to those wholesale electri electricity prices, and a question has come in around this, when will the, the electricity providers be set up for all of this? The, they haven't seen any information on their websites regarding tariffs or selling electricity back to the grid or what the yeah. network guarantee type rates would be. Yeah, so as I said, um, the effective date for the commencement of the clean export guarantee, which was referenced in the decision by the CRU, the Commission of Regulation of Utilities, is when the minister signs the regulations. And as I said, those regulations are currently sitting with the minister, so we expect them to be signed this week. Um, we will then notify the CRU, who will then communicate with the suppliers that this is now in effect in Irish law. They, will, they are then being required by the CRU to communicate with all of their existing registered microgenerators about aspects of how much they'll get paid, when they'll get paid, and how frequently they'll get paid. So this is all happening, you know, this week and into the into the following weeks. We will see a lot more activity and a lot more visible um, information on the websites of suppliers around the rates. There are rates already being referred to in the market. We know that originally Energia uh, referenced for people who are um, buying solar installations with them, 7.4 cents per kilowatt hour. But, you know, that was before the effective date of this uh, legislation. So we can expect it to be higher than that. And it will be differentiated by suppliers depending on what they want to do. If they're trying to acquire customers, they will offer a more attractive rate and they will compete with other suppliers on that basis. Question come in here, what is the CRU? So that's the Commission for Regulation of Utilities. So that is the regulator and all of this. But a related question come in here, is there a cap on what suppliers can charge? And will this be regulated? So far, shopping around, and I've seen differences of five thousand euro between solar systems. Do you want to comment on that, Rory, or is that regulated? So, so no, solar installations are. You know, if you're engaging with your solar energy electricity supplier to also um, procure a, a, an energy a solar installation, as far as I'm aware, that's not regulated by directly by the regulator. Mm -hmm. um, it's part of a, a commercial, an open commercial offering in the marketplace. Um, one interesting area that a lot of people might not be aware of is the fact that you can get accelerated capital allowances on farms for investing in these technologies. So you can write it off in one tax year as an accelerated capital allowances, which is something that is available at the moment. It might not always be available, but uh, it is a, a great incentive that people might not be aware of. Uh, a question has come in, does tax relief apply to non-domestic installs? Would you have anything to say on that, Rory? So oh, if they're referring to the tax exemption that was provided by the minister, that was only extended to the principal primary residence of domestic electricity consumers who are microgenerators. So there is no tax exemption for remuneration. And in fact, the uh, Department of Finance has confirmed that any revenues will be treated as in line with normal business revenues and taxed accordingly. Okay. A domestic, I'm a domestic home using 15,000 kilowatt hours per annum. Am I right? in that no grant is available above six kilowatts, only available to non-domestic, for example, farms. Well, no, the grant isn't available. The, it's only a TAMS grant is available on the farms. So this, there's no grant available. It, or, uh, we just clarify that, Harori, in this. The grant that you spoke about, which is going down so much per year, that is only available for, non, for domestic uh, less than 5.9 5 kilowatts. No, so it's available to domestic up to, at any size. Okay, so if you're a domestic consumer, you can install anything, but you're still limited to a maximum grant of 2,400 euros. Yeah. And if you're non-domestic, you're entitled to a grant for an installation up to six kilowatts. If your installation is greater than six kilowatts, then you're not entitled to a grant, but you can avail of the clean export premium tariff. And, and the rate for non-domestics up to six kilowatts is also maximum grant of 2,400 euros. Okay. Given that the solar will be producing during the day and not at night, Will the average market price paid be fixed at average day price when the electricity is produced and more valuable? Or will night time rates be included in the averaging calculation bringing down the value? So um, that's a matter for the CRU between them and the suppliers. What I would say to you is um, solar electricity particularly is more valuable than wind generated electricity and for a couple of reasons. 
as the uh, questioner rightly points out, if you're producing during the daytime, you're producing when people are consuming at, on average more than over the other remainder of the 24 hours of the day, which makes it more valuable. Um, and the other thing is, so wind is producing at night when the electricity is not as valuable. And the other thing is that there's a lot of wind. So when there's a, a large volume of, of wind being produced on windy days in Ireland, that total volume of electricity then begins to cannibalize its own value in the market. And so it reduces it because there's, there's a dearth, sorry, there's a, there's a glut of electricity in the marketplace. And you know it's not as valuable as a result of that. So solar PV at the moment on average is more, expensive, uh, more valuable, but we just have to caution that there's a lot more solar coming onto the system through res and through microgen and other means. And as a result of which, when it hits a scale, you know, it's going to reduce the average value of that cost. But I think the, the important point to, to note is there is what's called a technology capture price. So solar PV will have a particular profile of what it produces and how much it's worth during those times that it produces. And that is how suppliers will value that electricity in order to determine the clean export guarantee rate. Questions come in here about the, the MSS grants for, is it for PV only? Are there other micro generation technologies applicable like wind as well? So at the moment, SCAI are able to, uh, um, to process applications for, for solar PV only at the moment. As I said, under the micro generation support scheme, we did assess other technologies and we did determine that solar PV is the most economically viable. But if people want to install micro wind and micro hydro, we've asked the Sustainable Energy Authority, who is the granting authority, to assess extending the MSS grant scheme to those other technologies. And they're due to um, come back to us on that and to give us a proposal by June of this year. Questions come in here about the, uh, about the smart meters. Are they going to be necessary for calculating the, the payments under the clean export guarantee? And how much would a smart meter cost to get installed? So under the national uh, smart meter program, all electricity meters are being replaced between now and 2024. There is no cost to the end consumer directly for the exchange of their existing meter for a smart meter. All of the costs over a billion euros uh, related to the program are being smeared across all electricity consumers. So it forms part of your network tariffs, basically. Um, a smart meter isn't necessary to be eligible for the um, to, to receive remuneration by the Clean Export Guarantee, but it is necessary if a smart meter is available to you. So the program doesn't currently provide smart meters to all customer types. For example, there are no, currently no smart meters for non-domestic consumers. And there's also certain types of domestic consumers where they're, they're currently not rolling out smart meter exchanges for, the, for those cohorts. And on the basis of no meter being available, there will be a deemed calculation made for the volume of exported electricity if you've registered for an export grade connection and you're eligible. And the CRU has determined that that deemed export volume is 35% of the total generated volume of the installation. So you can get paid on a deemed basis if you know smart meter, but if one is available to you, you need to have a smart meter to be eligible. If a farmer installs a smart meter, will they need to pay a new peak electricity cost between 5 and 7 p.m. On their, during their evening milking time? So there's, as I understand it, there's no requirement to change your existing tariff uh, or supply contract with your supplier on the basis of a, a smart meter being exchanged. I, for example, have a smart meter in my home and I didn't have to move over to smart tariffs which as people may be aware, they broke, you know, we have, we're, we're well used to day night tariffs. Uh, they've been in, in Ireland for many decades. Smart tariffs break the day up into um, peak, off peak and, um, and nighttime. Um, and there's no need to transition on the basis of a smart meter, but it is an option for people to consider changing tariffs um, once they have a smart meter. Query has come in here, Rory, from, and it's uh, relevant to can dry stock farmers, because obviously dry stock farmers don't use a lot of electricity themselves, can they participate in the scheme on electricity generation if they don't use 20% of the power generated themselves? Yes, yeah, so the, the important thing to think about um, the clean export premium tariff is how you'll be remunerated and, and how you pay back the investment. So if you've got very low um, electricity demand on your site, the best way to get a short term payback is to have a small installation that's geared towards your small demand. If you still want to install more, then you can get a premium tariff. Uh, so if you're exporting to the grid, but that premium tariff is limited to 80% of the total generation. 
And after that, you will be able to get access to the clean export guarantee. But as, as you're, you're moving down through tiers of self-consumption at retail price has been offset at 23 cents, down to the clean export premium at 13 and a half cents, and the clean export guarantee at maybe 10 or 11 cents, we don't really know yet. You know, your ability to pay back your investment is reducing. So it's extending the timeline for you to get the payback. It doesn't mean it won't be viable, Look, solar PV is a viable technology depending on the horizon that you're looking at. And all solar PV will be paid back within 20 years, but 20 years isn't a very attractive timeline. So it's all about you working out what's the most uh, beneficial arrangement for you <clears> as an investment on your site. You, uh, the question there, you mentioned getting a competitively priced installation. How many suppliers are approved? Is has been the experience in other schemes that if more cost effective it's more cost effective to go without the grant and access lower cost com um, competition rather than to go to the grant route. How will this be addressed in the scheme? It, look, I mean, I think we, could, we can say that there is a feature of all grant schemes that, that changes the cost base in the market. But there are good reasons for that. Um, one is that those installers are, they have to um, pass the eligibility requirements to become registered um, uh, installers under the scheme run by the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. So they've got to prove themselves and they have to constantly maintain the quality of their work and they are um, audited by the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. Excuse me. And um, there are over 115 installers registered on the SEAI scheme. I'm not sure how many are registered on the TAM scheme. That's not a piece of information for to have. Um, but you know, there's a, there's a lot, there's an ever increasing number of installers in, engaging to become registered, and that naturally drives down competition, drives up competition rather, and drives down costs. And um, there's always an argument to say that if you're competent to design an installation and procure the materials yourself, and and then um, get a contract with an installer just to install the equipment, and you can deliver that for at lower cost, then by all means you should consider doing that. It's just that a lot of people wouldn't be comfortable doing that and they need the comfort of a registered and reputable installer. What's really important is that as consumers, you go and you drive the hardest bargain with those installers. And, and I know the farming community is very good at that generally, but also they're very good at organizing around their associations to get deals with installers around packages that are common in their industry and in their various sectors. So I'm sure that working okay. through IFA and others would be a good way to, to yeah. drive down those costs. A question, does PV have to be installed by improved companies or can it be done by approved local electricians? So in order to be eligible for the grant, you have to use a registered installer. Okay. Who claims the grant for PV installation? The is applicant it? claims the grant. Absolutely. They get that and yeah. they pay that. The, yeah, okay. So it's paid directly to them, yeah. Why no export electricity from TAMS? Why not a, a export of electricity from TAMS, particularly to the farmhouse? Surely it is beneficial from the clean energy perspective to supply the farmhouse. Okay, well, that's- I think you answered that already, Barry, didn't yeah, you? You said yeah, that there is an allowance yeah. uh, for that under the scheme. Okay, uh, we are, we will take one. Is the department going to consider farm-based AD in the small generation scheme with a higher tariff rate rather than for solar PV? as it is potentially can't compete, it's more expensive. Otherwise, with many additional benefits, uh, reduction of emissions, biofertilizer, et cetera. Look, it's a question that we often get. And, and just to say, I suppose, up front that anaerobic digestion is not um, producing renewable electricity per se. It produces renewable biogas, and it has the potential to produce renewable biomethane, which then can be used to produce electricity or it can be used in transport and other uh, heat applications. Um, and it's not therefore an eligible technology under the microgeneration support scheme, which is, which is targeted at renewable electricity generation. Um, there is other schemes available to support that. So the renewable uh, heat support scheme is currently supporting uh, anaerobic digestion and more information is available on our website in relation to the, the uh, RHSS. Okay. I'm going to leave it at that. We have a lot more questions in there, Rory, but we've gone well over the hour and uh, a lot of information there in the last file. But a lot of these people, I can get back to you directly because your names are in the system here. Some of them are in anonymously, so I can't get back to you, unfortunately. But uh, Rory, thank you very, very much for that. Rory Summers from the Department of, um, uh, um, of uh, Climate Action and Environment. Thank you very, very much. And Leo as well. 
Um, we may get back to you maybe in the future, Rory, on some of these areas as well, if further questions are coming on this and with new developments. So the domestic scheme is opening in the next couple of days, and it'll be the third quarter of this year before we see it happening uh, at, at, uh, in business and farm level as well. So with that, I want to thank Rory and Leo for being present here today and lots of interest in this whole area. We will be coming back to this topic down the line. We will do a webinar on the whole area of TAMS itself and payback calculations, because many of you are asking about the payback in these different scenarios. So there's no one answer to any of that. It's, you really have to work it out on an individual farm basis. What's your best option to go with here in this area? We will do a very specific webinar on paybacks uh, from Solar PV. So thank you all for viewing this morning with a very, very high attendance rate today and uh, talk to you again soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, folks.